And so let us begin our spiritual care for tonight. Good evening, everyone. Our four-part Zoom series this year is grounded in the work of Joanna Macy, who has developed ways to approach the overwhelming circumstances of a global nature, not by solving them or bypassing them, but by thoughtful, intentional, spiritual and political engagement. Macy explains that we're living in the time of the great turning when our choices, actions, and attitudes are essential to create and sustain a right relationship with the planet. Joanna developed the spiral shown here as an open invitation to a spiritual practice in hard times or overwhelming circumstances. Our thoughts and activities in each session of this series will be centered around the four themes of the spiral. Gratitude, honoring our pain, seeing in new ways, and then going forth. Exploring the spiral is best done in a group, in community as we are here tonight. We ask that everyone honor the working agreement shown here as we delve into the spiral together. And the working agreement has these parts. Speak for yourself, starting sentences with I. Bring your presence and participation. We want you to speak up. Ask before sharing anything offered here to anyone outside this group as our stories are our own. The most important thing is that we hear one another and experience being heard. We consider ourselves a community of practice. And we take a look at a quote from Pope Francis from his encyclical Laudato Si. And he says, the worship of the golden calf of old has found a new and heartless image in the cult of money and the dictatorship of an economy that is faceless and lacking any true humane goal. And Herman E. Daly says, there is something fundamentally wrong with treating the earth as if it were a business in liquidation. And so we ask ourselves about the theme for tonight. What is ecological economics? To help us answer that question, let's take a listen and a look at this very short video, which I think uh, in a very concise way explains to us. The definition of economics is the allocation of scarce resources toward alternative desirable ends. Where are markets appropriate? Where are markets not appropriate? And I think this recent financial collapse that the United States was at the helm of really has brought those kinds of questions back into vogue. Where are free markets, unregulated markets, the appropriate tool to encourage economic growth? Where do markets need to be regulated? And where are markets just not appropriate? That's the chief way to allocate scarce resources. Ecological economics really, again, answers that same question. How do we allocate scarce resources to meet alternative desirable ends? But looks at the scarce resources first and foremost and really questions what our ends are. If you open up any 
chapter one of an economics textbook, you see this circular flow diagram, this idea that the world can be broken up into households and firms, and we just need to sort of pay attention to the flows of goods and services and dollars between these two. If the environment appears anywhere, it's a sector within the economy. The starting point in mainstream economics is this mindset that the natural world is literally a subsystem of the larger economic system. I think we still have that mindset of there's always more resources over the next horizon. Or if the resources aren't here, we'll use our military assets to go and secure them. So fundamental starting point for ecological economics is to turn that on its head. Just to have a new starting point for the study of the economy as a subsystem of the larger ecological system. On day one of any ecological economics class, you draw the box and say this is the economy, and you draw the circle, and you say here's the ecosystem. And the economy is fundamentally dependent on the sustaining and containing the ecosystem. But that is a starting point that leads us to very different conclusions about the priorities of economies, about how economies function, and about how we answer that question, how do we allocate scarce resources to meet alternative desirable ends. And so let's just take a moment to ponder a little bit this question. Am I responding in a way that is considering ecological economics? Are my economic transactions supporting sustainable, ethical, and fair production, consumption, and investment? Are they supporting integral ecology? For example, are the producers of this product paid a fair and just wage? Are they using the Earth's resources in a sustainable manner? Am I aware of where my products come from and where they will end up? And as we hold those questions, let's take a look at some other thoughts from some other people. The environment and the economy are really two sides of the same coin. If we cannot sustain the environment, we cannot sustain ourselves. Jane Goodall says, you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Mary Lou Akawata says, when the people call Earth mother, they take love, they take with love, and with love they give back, so that all might live. And she continues, when the people call Earth it, they use her, consume her strength, and then the people die. And she goes on further in her, her poem and says, Already the sun is hot and out of season. Our mother's breast is going dry. She is taking all green into her heart and will not turn back until we call her by her name. The first part of the spiral is grounding ourselves in gratitude. 
if we're to face the dire circumstances of our time or of our own personal lives, both the facts and the emotions, we will be able to do so more resiliently if we start by grounding ourselves in gratitude. And we do this with intention. Gratitude isn't an innate talent. It's a skill that can be learned and grown. Gratitude is not dependent on external circumstances. Connecting with a sense of gratitude while available to all must also be practiced in order to be available. Fear, anxiety, and a sense of scarcity so abundant in this time can make it more difficult to access, but not impossible. Practicing allows a kind of spiritual gratitude muscle to grow and strengthen. And here are some quotes for us to ponder about gratitude. The second part of the spiral is honoring our pain. If we were to stop at the first part of the spiral, we might feel good, but not for long and not as deeply as possible. Joanna Macy tells us that to be able to move and shift out of stuck places, both emotionally and intellectually, we must do the hard work of facing complex, difficult emotions. We must honor our pain by naming it, even feeling it. It is in doing so that we're part of creating liberation from it, dissipating the power of pain to contort our behaviors into ugly or harmful shapes. In our culture, we do avoidance of pain really, really well. The second part of the spiral doesn't come easy, but it's crucial. Finding and creating both safe and brave space to be able to give shape and name to your pain, especially when this is done in community, 
allows transformation to take place. We're a part of a great collective existence that holds pain, but also holds other possibilities. And here are some slides to reflect upon. The third part of the spiral is seeing with new eyes. In other words, seeing in new ways. If we equip ourselves with the protection of gratitude, and if we've journeyed into the land of honoring our pain, what we just might find on the other side is a new way of beholding our circumstance new ways that generate healing and move us away from harm of ourselves or others. Leaning into our connection with others, we can consider new perspectives, help us see in new ways, help us entertain what may well be impossible, but may shed light on other actual possibilities. We'd like to play a video right now, a very short one of Joanna Macy that we feel ties in with seeing with new eyes. And she's talking about something called deep time. There is an aspect of the work that reconnects that I am finding increasingly significant and enjoyable. And that is our work with time. 
deep time, as we call it, which means, in essence, our relations with those who've gone before us and those who will come after us here on earth. I find this is ever more important as we see the industrial growth society accelerate its power and its decision making on an ever smaller piece of time, an ever shorter time frame. Short term thinking characterizes the industrial growth society. And this can be attributed to two developments. One is technological. Labor-saving devices, and especially computer technology and nanotechnology, so accelerate our capacity to uh, process information that there is almost no space for reflection, consideration, decision-making. This takes a huge toll on the human mind and body, what some people call hurry sickness. This short-term thinking is also a product of market forces, for the industrial growth society determines its goals and measures its success in terms of the gains made in a very short period, a quarter, an economic quarter, and this must grow. Choices are made depending on how they will affect this short term. This is inherently destructive of human society and of the natural world, which is based on longer rhythms. Hence, the value we find in the deep time exercises that have arisen from this work are really refreshing to the mind and inspiring to our vision. They help us inherit what the ancestors had. They had a felt connection with the generations that had gone before, as well as with the generations that were going to follow them. They spent years and accumulations of wealth and great effort to create monuments of learning or art for generations to follow. Whereas we, with our short-term thinking, was well, that the only endurable thing that we're leaving behind is toxic dumps because we've discounted the future. So deep time work, as I've said, arises to correct this, and I must say is marvelously refreshing. Not only does this assist us in creating a larger time context for our lives, which gives us a sense of expansion of the spirit helps us feel the companionship of the past and future generations in a most heartening way but it also can help steady us in the present moment so now we'd like to move on to a guided meditation. It is a meditation based on a poem by Claire Rousel. It's called Becoming Good Ancestors. So if you'd like to get yourself situated and comfortable, we'll start. Close your eyes. Take several slow, deep breaths and slowly let them out. Imagine in your mind that you're moving into the distant future on our planet. You arrive and find yourself standing in front of a group of people. 
you recognize them because they resemble you. They are your future descendants. Gaze deep into their faces and listen. Listen to what they want to say. They are wanting to tell us something, these future people. The people of whom we are their ancestors, yet they are the wiser. They are wanting to tell us that what we do now matters. They want us to know that they see the dismembered ways that we live and how difficult it is for us to remember how to return to the family of all things. But their existence is testament to the fact that it is possible. They know we feel trapped by this system of entanglements and obligations and the amputations of our imaginations in a system that only ever intended to keep us blind to the bars of our cages. But they want to remind us that there was a time when we could not imagine a world order that was not based on the divine right of kings. And before that even, there was a time when we knew what it was to belong. When we knew we were the firefly and the ocean, the stuff of stars and the breath of birds. They ask you, stroking your hair and touching your face. How did you know that something else was possible? Where did that idea germinate inside you? Show us, point to the place. Tell us a story of summoning your brothers and sisters to revolt for a life of connection and dignity. For what dignity is possible if dignity is not available for all? They ask you, how did you manage to build this world in the flames of capitalism? And yet all the while, you were disconnected from your rituals, from the rhythms and songs of your people, the tiny sacred acts of care that ensure that the world is recreated with every dawn chorus. How did you handle knowing all that you knew without becoming paralyzed with terror and with despair? What did you do with your despair, personal, collective, ancestral? How did you carry its magnitude in your heart without being overcome with madness? Or perhaps while carrying your madness, your addictions and your chronic sadness, never really knowing the full extent of your vitality. Did you carry pieces of it everywhere you went? Stuffed in pockets and purses like used tissues? pooling out every pot and pan as the house flooded with tears? Did you feel it hanging in the air and walking alongside you, the ghosts of extinct creatures following you around, reminding you of all that is at stake, suffocating you with the thickness of their memory? Did you taste it in your food, forced from the soil and sea with chemicals and violence? Food that no longer nourished, but flared up in rashes and welts as it entered your body? 
Did you feel the suffering as you dressed yourself in the forced labor of people and animals? Their exhaustion stitched into the seams and hems of your clothes. We see you, they say, standing on the shore with 500 years of industry and environmental wreckage and slavery and torture at your back, gasping under its weight with only the vast black sea in front of you. We see you. We see you holding the crumbling world in one hand and the germinating seed of life in the other. We know you are listening, listening to your children, to the wind, to the birds, to the voice that startles you from sleep just before dawn, to the harbingers of a new consciousness. We feel how you allow your heart to be broken while every day preparing the house for love, making up her bed, setting a place for her at your table, all with no good reason for hope and every reason to despair. We see what is to come for you and what will remain when the storm from which there will be no refuge is over. We see in you the thousands of varieties of potato and corn and wheat, the cornucopia of culture and craft, language and art, the compassion and commitment to the value of the life of the individual and the group. We know what you've known across time and species, across geography and incarnation. We know what you are capable of. We salute you, they say, because what you do now matters. Look once more into the faces of your future descendants and thank them for this time together, this sacred connection. As their faces fade away, slowly, as you are ready, come back to the present, this time and place. We are going to move into um, a smaller, uh, smaller groups just for a few minutes, but we're going to take a look at five, what Joanna Macy calls the five vows. Um, I'd like to call them the five promises. And what she says is these five promises might help us to connect to this deeper time, to this relationship with those who have gone before and those who will come after. And so I will read these five promises. And in our breakout groups, if we would just take a few moments, if one or more touch your heart more, you may want to share a little bit about um, your thoughts on a particular promise. Um, or if something from the meditation touched your heart, um, I invite you to share that in your small group as well. I commit myself daily to the healing of our world and the welfare of all beings. 
I will live on earth more lightly and less violently in the food products and energy I consume. I will draw strength and guidance from the living earth, the ancestors, the future beings, and our siblings of all species. I will support you in your work for the world and to ask for help when I need it. And I will pursue a daily spiritual practice that clarifies my mind, strengthens my heart, and supports me in observing my commitments. So we'll go into a breakout room. These five uh, promises will be in the, uh, in the chat room as well. So I invite you to share um, a little bit deeper on the reflection, the meditation, or on one or more of these, of these uh, promises, these commitments. And we'll have about 10 minutes. Uh, it's not a long time, but enough maybe to share um, a few thoughts. Is everyone back? I think so. Uh, maybe we could take a few moments if anyone would like to share uh, within the large group um, any thoughts, any words of wisdom, anything that your heart uh, wishes to share. Uh, we're a small enough group, so uh, if you'd like to share, just please feel free to uh, to speak up. Many times what someone shares is really meant for someone else to hear. So with uh, total confidence, please. Well, I really appreciated uh, being in a group with Bill. And I think there's two words that come to my mind from our conversation. One of them is intention. And that is to be intentional about the things that we do uh, with regard to our um, ecological economics. Um, and the second uh, was about hope, that um, despite the mess the world is in right now, I have that sense that both of us hold hope as we move forward. And so um, that was meaningful for me. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Evelyn. Anyone else? Um, I've been um, uh, continually reminded of the of the power of of um, taking action in the face of despair. Um, is is such a potent act of hope and and generates more hope um, that that um, despair is in this work is unavoidable 
we are not winning this battle at the moment. Um, but um, I think there is reason for hope. I agree with Evelyn and Bill. And, um, and acting is as if there is hope is an act of faith too. And, and I think that's what we need to be doing. So. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Anything that spoke to your heart? Dorothy, you're muted. Our group sort of took the opposite way because we wondered if uh, uh, people from earlier cultures really uh, were consciously trying uh, to uh, to protect the environment or if it was just that uh, because there were fewer of us, uh, we couldn't do that much uh, damage. But I think it also speaks uh, underlyingly uh, to the subject of hope because uh, even at this point, we have some idea of what we should be doing, uh, but we don't know if we're going to win or uh, or not. So we just have to do our best and take the gamble. But uh, I do believe yet, uh, until I'm proven that it was hopeless, I like as if there is hope. Thank you for sharing, Dorothea. Thank you. Anyone else? I think the the Claire Roussel poem and uh, the recitation of that really, for Evelyn and, and me, we both have grandchildren and so you know, I was certainly prompted to think in terms of multiple generations. And, you know, I think nobody feels that we're going to be able to take the world back to the way it was, at least not in our lifetimes or even probably the lifetime of our descendants. I mean, the CO2 we've emitted is going to be up there for you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years. And, but if, if we don't take action, if we don't go forth as the last phase of the cycle emphasizes, if we don't go forth and try to take action, it will only get worse for our descendants. So whether it's in terms of our own personal consumption and <clears throat> their behavior or political action to work on changing the system. And I think change is needed to keep things from further deteriorating. Thank you, Bill. And so we we hold what was shared and in in uh, voices and what was shared in our small groups and all those things we hold in our hearts, uh, those wishes, those de those desires, and we move forward in in going forward with hope. The fourth and last part of the spiral is called going forth. With the first three points of the spiral, we are cultivating resilience, building stamina, and growing emotional and spiritual intelligence. <clears throat> this fourth point on the spiral is where we take what we've integrated as individuals and as a group practicing together and apply it to our lives, to our communities, and to society. The hope is that in going forth, you've been strengthened so that you can be of service to what Joanna calls 
the great turning, that you might now embody the courage and creativity that is required of all of us in this time of crisis, in this time of opportunity. Enjoy these following slides and quotes about going forward. I don't know if you noticed, but many of those quotes were from young, very young Latino environmentalists. Uh, September, beginning the 15th, we celebrate in our country um, Hispanic Heritage Month. And I found so many young Hispanic um, men and women uh, in their 20s, in their teens, 20s, and 30s who are very involved in this work and uh, many of the quotes that I've taken were from, uh, from their own hearts, from their own work, um, those who will lead us into the future. Uh, we'd like to close tonight with a, um, 
a song from Earth Mama, Joyce Rouse. Her stage name is Earth Mama, and she speaks of holy ground. George? We'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. I'd like to thank Kathy and Donna for their help and hard work with our program, and we hope that, uh, that you found it meaningful. We'll be having another program uh, in the next uh, three months, so be looking for that if you'd like, and we hope you'll join us again. Have a blessed week, everyone. Thank you, George. Thank you, Thank you George Donna. Donna. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us.